My name is Noemi, and I am a correspondent for The Forge. This is the Notable Leftists and Revolutionary series. Today, I'll be talking about Francis M. Biel. So I had the very good fortune to be able to go to university, and that's where I first read an essay by Francis Biel. The, the professor of the class was someone who was in the same organization as Francis M. Biel in the 1970s. Biel was and is a fierce fighter for women's rights and wrote about intersectional feminism before the term was coined. And so why do I talk about Biel? Uh, because we're in an era of tokenism when it comes to feminists, and uh, feminists are not actually recognized as widely as they should be, we should be, and black women especially don't get the feminist rec recognition that they deserve, and I say they because I'm not a woman, I am black. Uh, Bill needs recognition along with all the other Marxist feminists. Now when it comes to Beale, uh, it's very important to remember that she tells the truth regardless of how unsettling it may be and some people take that as an attack but uh, as you watch this and I'd like you to remember what it's like to be the person telling your truth and how it feels when people treat you like you're attacking them with your truth. So let's go into timeline and years. I just want to note from my research, I can say that the Beale Wikipedia page is unreliable. Uh, Wikipedia in general is. Uh, but Beale was born in 1940. That was the year that um, we saw a lot of invasions during World War II. Uh, Captain America was first published in 1940. Patty McDaniels was the first African American to win an Academy Award for her role as Mammy. And Benjamin O. Davis Sr. becomes the first African American general in the United States Army. We also saw rioting in Chicago, Harlem, LA, and Detroit in 1940. Oh, also leftists will know this one. Uh, in 1940, that was the year that Trotsky was also assassinated. So depending on what source you look at, uh, 1969 or 1970 is the year that Double Jeopardy was written. Beale wrote this and it was a proto-intersectional feminist work. We'll get into Double Jeopardy more in depth later. But 1969 is the year that we saw Woodstock, a lot of protesting of the Vietnam War, the Stonewall Riots, the Chicago 7 trial, and there was a crackdown in the United States on student protesting. Going into the year 1970, this is popularly considered the start of the women's movement, as people usually refer to the women's movement. Um, there was a no-fault divorce law passed in California. The Beatles disbanded in 1970. Uh, the Chicago 7 were found guilty and people were still protesting the Vietnam War, although in smaller numbers, and the National Guard killed four student protesters at Kent State University. So that's what was going on around the time that Double Jeopardy was written. So here's the first quote that I've got from Beale, talking about the Ku Klux Klan. Another sector which has suffered from clan opposition and repression is the organized labor movements. Labor organizers have been tarred and feathered and murdered by Klansmen. Workers on strike have been brutalized by Klan actions and the attempt to prevent white and black workers from organizing together in unions has been a major aim of the Klan for years and has been relatively successful over a period of time, which explains in part why the South is still a haven for non-union shops and factories and a bastion of social of in a bastion of backwardness in social and political as well as economic affairs. So several things I'd like to point out is uh, this idea of the organized labor movement being broken up by clan members. So when we talk about um, getting uh, black and white workers and people of all races together as, a, as workers, um, we should know when we criticize that idea that the Klan also was pro-separation. The Klan worked with violence towards separating black and white workers and workers of all races. 
uh, did not want them to unite together to get better conditions. And so when we on the left talk about uh, workers of different races and how we can or cannot work together, we should definitely keep this in mind and who benefits from our division. The next quote, while the Klan has been growing in power and influence, the People's Movement has not yet mounted a serious offensive against the Klan and other right-wing groups. We cannot any longer delay in taking up this task. The stakes are very high. These American white sheets represent the advance guard of a tendency towards fascism in this country, a tendency which must be halted if we are not to lose what pitiful social what pitiful civil and social rights are left to us after a decade of setbacks on all fronts. So here she's considering the 1970s a decade of setbacks. The people's movement has not yet mounted a serious offensive against the Klan. This becomes significant to us today in 2019 because the Klan is still definitely at large. Fascism, as she mentions, fascism was on the rise at that time. Now we're seeing the culmination of it. Uh, we have a straight up fascist regime in office. That's something that we should use when we analyze our methods today, uh, which we should be doing every day is reflecting on the methods that we've been using and seeing how effective they are and getting advice from history, etc. The next quote, we must demand a thorough ongoing investigation of the Klan and its links to other hate groups and the new right. Massive educational campaigns showing the real nature of these groups of terrorists should be undertaken with the aim of mobilizing hundreds of thousands in opposition to the Klan in the near future. So I find this interesting because she uses this term, the new right. So I'm wondering if that's like an ongoing myth that has been perpetrated, that there's a new right, there's a, a new far right, an alt right. Um, that's not like the usual, right? This is some new extreme. But if this happened in 1980, then what is happening now? This is worth uh, examining in our examining of myths perpetrated by the right in order to conceal the truth. As we know, truth is concealed from us for a reason. The closer we get to untangling all the contradictions of capitalism, the closer we get to getting a revolutionary mindset. So now I'm going to move on to Beale's writing from 1969-1970 called Double Jeopardy, To Be Black and a Woman. Here she writes about black womanhood and I this really resonates with me because I'm a fab person assigned female at birth I'm not a woman I am black and I do experience misogyny so uh, let's begin uh, the women's movement is far from being monolithic any white group that does not have an anti-imperialist and anti-racist ideology has absolutely nothing in common with the black woman struggle are white women asking to be equal to white men in their pernicious treatment of third world peoples? What assurances have black women that white women will be any less racist and exploitative if they had the power and were in a po position to do so? These are serious questions that the white women's liberation movement has failed to address itself to. So I think that this quote is important because we currently in 2019 see a lot of uh, criticisms of white women and we may think that this is new and radical rhetoric but people like Frances Beale have been talking about it uh, since the 1960s, 1970s, and it's from my my perception of the way that she's addressing it is that she's sort of open. She's open. She's kind of instructing white women on how to do feminism in a way that's effective and what they need to do to be accepted into our spaces or into our solidarity, which we know is a gift. 
The new world that we are struggling to create must destroy oppression of any type. The value of this new system will be determined by the status of those persons who are presently most oppressed. The low man on the totem pole. Unless women in any enslaved nation are completely liberated, the change cannot really be called a revolution. If the black woman has to retreat to the position she occupied before the armed struggle, the whole movement and the whole struggle will have retreated in terms of truly freeing the colonized population. So this really speaks to me when I'm looking at trying to free myself and others right now. Uh, with queer theory, we know that many people who might be described as a woman in Beale's time uh, also include uh, AFAB people who are non-binary and we also know that trans women are now part of the conversation. I think that this still holds true even considering in the way that the conversation around gender has changed. Here's another quote. Unfortunately, in relation to the black woman, the old myths and distortions are all too too often still prevalent even among black scholars. While it is generally agreed that the black woman has played several roles and is expected to continue to do so, what is quite distressing is the fact that whatever role we play, it is assumed that it will be a role secondary to the black male. The backward ideas that are so prevalent among certain nationalist fo forces concerning the black woman are extremely divisive to the overall struggle for social justice and e economic equality in this country. Many black women are turned off because of the blatant chauvinist attitudes exhibited by their brothers and become frustrated and disillusioned with so-called revolutionary organizations. I can really um, relate to what she's saying. I totally stand in solidarity to what she's saying, even though, again, I'm not a woman, I'm an AFAB non-binary person. However, my experiences are very much aligned with hers. And um, I would venture to say that an organization that is not fighting sexism, including uh, anti-trans sexism, is an organization that is useless, as she's basically said. So here are some examples that she goes on to give of these mistruths and distortions that are popular among black nationalists of her time. The first one, the only people who have ever been free in this country are white men and black women. So that's not true. Uh, but that's what black liberationists were saying at the time. And I think I, I've heard that one the next one is one that might surprise you. Uh, a matriarchal family structure exists within the black community. So this one is used, and many of us have said it ourselves, but this one is a myth that's used to say that we don't need feminism, that women don't need freeing. Um, by saying that matriarchy already exists and women already have power, that undermines this uh, need for liberation among black women. The next one, uh, black women didn't have it so hard under slavery and afterwards. And if you agree with this one, you can read Bell Hook's Ain't I a Woman? That book explains in the beginning how black women had it, or black AFABs had it during slavery, and it was hard. It was hard, hard times. Okay, so this next one uh, is even it's even rumored that like Stokely Carmichael said stuff like this uh, a woman's role is to have babies for the revolution I mean I believe it I believe because men say this sort of thing all the time if we all learn sexism and then we enter what's called a revolutionary space um, you know there's no guarantee that people just give up their sexism it's up to people like a uh, feminist like Beale to uproot these issues and so I really respect her for 
writing about this. At the time that she wrote about it, this is kind of like before the women's movement even really like got full steam. Um, she's like a radical, a real radical. So she goes on to say, these are but a few of the common misconceptions and distortions of history that continue to plague the black woman and the black struggle as a whole. So this next quote comes from a piece uh, from 1981. I love the title, Slave of a Slave No More. The Afro-American woman continues to experience the age-old oppression of woman by man. In the home, she becomes the slave of a slave. By giving men a false feeling of superiority in the home or in relationships with women, certain aspects of capitalist tension are alleviated. Men may be cruelly exploited and subjected to all kinds of dehumanizing tactics on the part of the ruling class, but at least they can take out their frustration on someone else, their women. Okay, next quote. While many black studies programs have insisted on the incorporation of African history into the curriculum, the perspective is generally approached on a Me Too level. Me Too had great empires. Me Too had great kings. All was rosy and bright until the appearance of the nasty European. The role of women is projected as submissive and passive, and the men is all powerful and aggressive. A closer look at African history reveals, however, that many African women have also been slaves to African men, and many still are. We learn that conditions under colonialism were wretched for women, but also that conditions were oppressive before the European ever arrived in Africa. We must not forget that there were slaves during those times and women had lost the power, for the most part, to own land and be economically and therefore socially self-reliant. Many African societies had men with many wives, which they purchased for so many heads of cattle and they were sometimes treated no better than beasts of burden. In many African societies today, the woman is but a piece of property of the man. So, I, if I can comment on this, I just want to say that just because uh, there are white people in the United States who say in bad faith that Africans enslaved each other, like they say that as a justification um, for white people owning slaves, and honestly, that's not even a justification. That that could be true, and it's true that it's not okay that white people own black slaves. I, I like this challenge to our organizing, this challenge that says uh, we have to go deeper than simply saying decolonize, and decolonization is very important, and we also have to understand or ask ourselves what happens when we decolonize and go back to a tradition that's sexist. We go back to a tradition that assigns genders and oppresses people based on their sex. What do we do when decolonization is pointing towards that, when decolonization is pointing towards a different kind of slavery? Are we okay with that? And that's what Frances Beale and many other feminists of her time were asking. Next quote. The days of kings and queens presupposes commoners, presupposes a privileged class and an exploited one. We must never forget that it was through the accommodationist policy carried out by certain ruling, ruling class African elements which collaborated with the slave trade and played a part in sending us to these wretched shores. So this is from Slave of a Slave No More. I wish I had a t-shirt that said Slave of a Slave No More. I love it. Um, let's talk about what this quote means. So first, um, she's talking about presupp presuppositions. What are presuppositions? 
Okay, so here's a silly example of a presupposition. For example, if someone, um, you're talking to someone about a bleach stain on your couch and they say, oh, do you use a red marker to, to color in the bleach stain? So their presupposition is that you have a red couch and so the red marker would work for you. Um, what Francis Beale here is talking about is the presupposition um, presupposing commoners, presupposing a privileged class. And so that's what black scholars had done in the past, talking about we were kings, we were queens. Um, they're presupposing that a privileged class and a commoner class is just a given. That's something that we should examine a little more fully. Uh, and just instead of just saying like we were kings we were queens we want to go back to that we should examine rather whether king kingship and queenship is a legitimate form of rule and a legitimate form of governing and then next francis beale talks about an accommodationist policy so while we're examining whether or not kingship and queenship is what we want we also have to examine what kingship and queenship has done for us black people in the past us being african indigenous people who were sold through accommodationist policies accommodationist policies being accommodating the europeans who wanted slave labor and so what she seems to be telling us here is that kings and queens were not taken as part of the slave trade it was the indigenous people the regular folk like us who are the descendants of the indigenous peoples who were brought here the indigenous peoples who survived that wretched ride across the atlantic and then survived to be here as slaves which was also wretched and so she's saying that the ruling class african elements collaborated with the slave trade so it wasn't every single african person who was at risk of being taken overseas as a slave. And I think that this is important because it's really time to start melding gender and socioeconomic class with black liberation politics because it all ties in together. So uh, let's talk about why people don't talk about Francis Beale. And this is an image from um, the lunch counter sit-ins with the SNCC, which Francis Beale was a part of. So I'm going to read you this quote. It says, During the civil rights movement, outrage at the violation of black women through sterilization abuse and frustration with benighted patriarchal ultranationalist beliefs about the reproductive roles of black women on the part of some male members within organizations such as SNCC, the Black Panthers, Muslim and Pan-African groups led to the decision by Frances Beale and other women seeking self-determination to form all-female organizations, such as the Black Women's Liberation Committee and the Third World Women's Alliance in 1969 through 1970. So this is from a Black Women's Activism written in 2006. And Basically, what it's telling us is that black women in the late 60s, early 70s, and throughout all time have been assaulted from both sides, both from those who claim to be for black liberation and both also from those who are racist imperialists with imperialist interests. So if both sides are attacking black women, for race and for gender, uh, Frances Beale and others like her decided to make their own organizations where black women could start with intersectional feminist politics before the word intersectionality was coined. They were intersectional feminists and they talked about imperialism, race, gender, how they all intersect, how they're all equally problems and how you can't get rid of one and leave the others. What's the reason why people don't talk about Beale is probably because she left these organizations with men who were well known, but those men were sexist men. Um, they were very well known, they got away with their sexism, 
uh, her organization full of women who were, you know, assaulted on all sides, these women were not given the recognition that they deserved. Frances Beale is still alive. And I think that we should give her her roses while she's still alive. There's other reasons why people don't talk about black Marxist feminists and Frances Beale in particular. Um, one being that she gives us very inconvenient things to talk about, things that many people are not ready to examine, like the fact that black women have been slaves prior to colonization in Africa. Um, Here's another quote that will probably make a lot of people uncomfortable, but I looked into it and it is true. A deeper examination of various aspects of our development in this country exposes some painful facts. Some blacks who were able to purchase their own freedom eventually were able to earn money and they could own slaves of their own. By 1830, some 3,777 Negro slave owners holding their brothers and sisters in perpetual slavery were recorded. Today, we can look toward the black capitalist trying to use us as wage slaves. Nationhood, in most cases, still has a capitalist base and as long as it does, there can be no freedom for African and Afro-American women. So I looked up this fact, this fact about the slaves, um, freed slaves owning people. What I found is that that was under the grounds of philanthropy, quote unquote. But when you look at it, when, um, when a husband who has been freed still owns his wife as property and then when she has kids and they become property um you kind of have to question why were these men so hesitant to free their wives so this brings up those same questions that we were talking about about uh gender oppression and how do black women get free is the black liberation movement just as it exists is this the best we could be doing these are all questions that we need to ask ourselves constantly and we have to ask ourselves what sort of things myths are we perpetuating that are keeping black women in shackles so let's talk a moment about why Frances Beale is important along with all other Marxist feminists. Uh, we have to acknowledge that feminism is upheld as a widely criticized political ideology, but it is crucial for anti-capitalists and anti-racists. All of us have absorbed misogyny growing up under capitalism and that makes it very easy to dismiss feminism and it makes it easy to criticize feminism. So we must resist that initial urge to reject feminism. Uh, we must listen to radical leftist feminists like Frances Beale, those that people have tried to erase from history and erase from black liberation. And what I've learned is that the type of information that makes us uncomfortable and cringe is just information that helps us get sharper and get more dangerous in a good way. And it forces us to change directions in revolution making, and that is a good thing. It is good because we have to be adaptable and we have to find out the truth. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Noemi. This has been a Notable Leftists and Revolutionaries video with The Forge. Stay tuned for more. Bye!